Please be seated. Friends and colleagues, students, fellow Tulsans, and guests from near and far, welcome to the University of Tulsa. And thank you for being here this morning to share in this special moment, this most special honor for our friend. Today we celebrate the life of a leader, a colleague, a scholar, a teacher, a citizen, an artist, a husband, a father, a grandfather, and of course a dear friend, Stedman Upham. His vision and work have forever shaped both the University of Tulsa and the city we proudly call home. It is natural that we are awash in emotions today. Mostly we grieve the loss of a great man. But alongside this heaviness, we are lifted by our gratitude and for the tremendous progress that Stead led as the president of the University of Tulsa and as a passionate Tulsan, and in other ways and in other places earlier in his career. Throughout his life, he created profound opportunities for others. He changed more lives than we could ever know. As we take note of all those here today, we also celebrate the power of community and the strength we find in each other. Stead placed the power of community at the center of his work, and wisely so because it transcends time and limitations. We are also instructed by the example of leadership that Stead set, an example that we will hear more about today. I want to thank today's speakers, the Reverend Jeff Francis, Sharp Chaplain, who will give our invocation and a remembrance of Stead. James Ronda, the H.G. Barnard Chair of Western American History Emeritus, and Kent Lightfoot, Professor of Anthropology at the University of California, Berkeley. Professor Lightfoot's friendship with Stead goes back all the way to graduate school. We also will hear from Stead and Peggy's adult children, Nathan Upham and Aaron Upham Lopez, and from their grandson, Orion Upham Lopez. Finally, we thank the members of TRIO Tulsa for providing music today. Professors Deanne Buccineri, Maureen O'Dowd, and Roger Price. Now, Chaplain Francis will deliver the invocation. Thank you, President Clancy. I'd invite you, if you would, to join with me in prayer. Southern God, we gather here seeking your comforting presence as we celebrate the life of one called by your providential hand to this university, President Stedman Upham. In our grief, we seek to be embraced by strength of your strong and secure arms. In particular, we pray for Stead's family, for Peggy and Nathan, Aaron, Alejandro, Orion, and Adrock, and their extended families. May they feel the secure presence of the palm of your hand as you hold them this day. We pray as well for our university, our city, Stead's friends, his colleagues, that they may too experience the comfort and strength. Bring us this day, O oh Lord, healing and wholeness. Continue to fill the raw hole in our hearts. Gracious Lord, may you this day begin to apply your healing balm so that we may, through our tears, celebrate this, your child. Bring us comfort as only you in your providence may do. To you, O oh Lord, we offer great praise, thanksgiving for your ever embracing grip of grace. Amen. Go forth into the world in peace, have courage, hold fast to that which is good, render no one evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, honor everyone. This blessing is based upon Paul's first epistle to the Thessalonians in chapter 5. It was a primary blessing that I uh, heard each Sunday as a child. 
uh, being raised in a Presbyterian congregation as we were sent out to serve. This blessing has been running through my mind for these last 20 days. As I thought about Stead, who was my boss, who was my colleague, most importantly, he was my friend. I've often stopped to wonder if Stead had also heard this same blessing as a child, as he was raised as a child in a Presbyterian church. I wonder because in so many ways, Stead lived out these words faithfully here at the University of Tulsa. Over the past week since Stead's death, many members of the university community in the city of Tulsa and beyond have shared numerous heartfelt thoughts regarding Stead. Our mayor, G.T. Bynum, shared the wisdom Stead had passed on to him regarding Stead's perspective on leadership, and in particular, these words Mayor Bynum uh, uh, highlighted. As a leader, you have to, uh, you have day-to-day -day responsibilities, but you also have, for a lack of better word, pastoral responsibilities. You have a responsibility to take care of and be there for the people you lead. So very, very true. And that was how I encountered Stead for the 12 years that I served as his chaplain. Stead was the one who appointed me to the chapel. I was one of his first appointments. It was Stead's blessing and his uh, sending forth that the, chapel, that the chapel would be a place of hospitality and of warmth, a heart of the university that made the chapel grow. One of the best examples of, uh, of this is a, is a comment, a servant uh, leadership role. One of the best examples was a comment uh, Stead made to Susan Neal, which she shared uh, a couple of weeks ago. When Susan came uh, on board, Stead commented um, that uh, he would look forward to working with or for uh, Susan. I know it took Susan back. She'd never heard someone say, I, I will be working for you. But in actuality, that was that mutuality inherent in his leading an organization and an institution. He understood servant leadership and this university in its role to serve. And that was the ethos he was creating. John Lapine, senior, who was one of our SA presidents, uh, former alumnus, he is now president of the new Crossover Academy here in Tulsa, in a Facebook post said this, for years when people ask me what my long-term career goal is, I have answered that I want to be the president of TU. The wisdom, faith, and service that I saw exemplified in the life and leadership of Stedman Umpham made an indelible impression on me during my four years at TU. He was dignified, never pompous, brilliant, never conceited, courteous, never cloying, generous, never patronizing. In mind, he possessed a genuine love for learning that spanned all the arts and sciences. In body, he celebrated athletics, fitness, adventure, and travel. In spirit, I saw an intertwining of leadership and service that reminded me of Christ washing the disciples' feet. How blessed we were at TU to enjoy two terms and 12 years under his leadership. Amen. Stead's intertwining of servant leadership and service was something I will always cherish for Stead weighted equally the motto on our seal, wisdom, faith, and service. The emphasis on service was truly amazing. I, I cannot remember in my lifetime, as I have been at this university, where the service had been, has been so heavily emphasized. The brilliance of the True Blue Neighbor Initiative will leave a remarkable and lasting legacy at TU. 
President Clancy offered these wonderfully defining words regarding Stead's tenure at the University of Tulsa. Stead had a tremendous impact on TU and the Tulsa community. If you just walk on this campus, everywhere you look, you see his imprint as far as taking TU and making it a beautiful campus. He really increased our footprint as a destination and a place to be. Thank you, beautifully and wonderfully said. And as I've reflected on these three comments, I was profoundly struck by what I have always admired about Stead. There were, there were a number of things, but the one thing I admired about him was his artistic ability. I'm not an artist. In fact, the best thing I can do is draw a turkey and that's to put my hand up and trace it. But Stead had a, a, an incredible style as an artist, and I, I'm going to propose that that's where you see the uniqueness of his organizational understanding. His style was called a pointillist style. It is a style that is at once simple and profound. As he paints, it, he drops, I gather, I, I'm not sure what the artistic terms are, forgive me for this, but as he paints, he would place a drop of acrylic gel, gel paint on a canvas. And he would begin to create his work by these little dots of acrylic gel paint. And each one had a space between them. And it was really fascinating to go up to, to his painting and, and to see, I mean, to look at it, take your glasses off, look at it closely, and to see that the painting that we see is simply a series of dots with spaces between them. They're in close proximity, but together they form this incredible, beautiful abstract work. I think it's important to realize that that space in between those dots is really where Stead worked here on campus. One of my uh, now favorite uh, philosophers, uh, Stead turned me on to him, was a, a philosophical anthropologist by the name of Clifford Gertzey. Gertzi understood that human cultural interactions are based upon a wink, are fundamentally uh, shared human meanings. Perhaps very simply, a nod, a wink, an understanding, the invisible space between the points in his pointillistic work. You see, I would argue Stead was creating a masterpiece here at TU. And it was at the human level he was bringing together all of us on campus in his own way, drawing us into a picture. But he understood to do that, you must have the knowledge of the, of the hopes and the visions and the desires, but also the struggles and the difficulties of each and every person here. And that's the space in between the points. That's what gives the background the ability for the points to draw us in and to be. It is in there that he was pastoral. It was in there that he understood how to serve. It was in there that his comment to Susan was very real. I look forward to work for you. Because he worked at the shared assumption level. He worked about at that level of a smile of a wink, of a nod. That is probably, I would say, his masterpiece. And Jerry is right. When you look at Tulsa, you see his imprint. Why? Because of each of you here and your connection with TU, each of you were intentionally put together, shaped, pointed to create this incredible masterpiece you see all around us.
Peggy, Aaron, and Nathan, and Alejandro, and uh, Orion, and Adrock. Our hearts break with you, but our hearts engulf you. We give you thanks for your husband, for your father, for your father-in-law, for your grandfather. We give you thanks for all he did and for working between the points where human lives really matter and where understanding is so, so critical. I pray that as you hear the comments today and the memories, that although they may bring a tear, we pray that the healing comes in the remembrance and the vision looking forward that you will always see Stead as his hand has left this imprint on our great university. So Deo Gloria, to God alone be all glory. Dear friends, this morning we celebrate a generous life well lived and taken too soon from us. Stead was a force of nature. When he walked into a room, you knew that you were in the presence of promise, the power of possibility. It wasn't his size, it was the size of his ideas, his energy, the passion of his imagination, the dreams he had for all of us. To be with Stead was to believe that we could be part of something larger, something more important than just ourselves. With Stead, it was never all me all the time. It was always about us, about what we could accomplish together. With Stead, it was always try a little harder, be a little better, go the extra mile. Now, these are not cliches. They're the words that shaped a life, Stead's life. Some leaders build fortresses, others build communities. Stead was community's man. Well, how should we take the measure of such a man? Perhaps we should start with some bits and pieces. Stead was an accomplished scholar, a gifted artist. He was an ardent sports fan, always there to support student athletes. If you want to see pure joy, find a photo of Stead at a TU game or sporting event. And sometimes, Stead could be a very funny guy. If you've not seen the 2012 video of the president ordering the athletic department to create a student athlete glee club, then you've missed a classic Upham performance. Not Oscar quality, but close. The names on the buildings at TU are a geography of generosity. Instead added to that landscape with names like Collins and Case, Razor and Stevenson, Helmrich and Hardesty. And along with friends like Charles Norman and Fulton Collins, Bill Fisher, Court, and Martha Dietler, Stead and Bob Shipley's crew transformed the face of this campus and transformed lives as well. And when the future of the Gilcrease Museum was in doubt, Stead created to you Gilcrease. He did all these things, was all these things, with great grace and skill. But that's not the half of it, because Stead's life cannot be counted up by honors and accomplishments, programs created and goals reached. To borrow a line from Duke Ellington, Stead was beyond category. In all his commitments and responsibilities, obligations and enthusiasms, Stead had a core identity. And we can say that with one word. He was at heart a teacher. Yes, he was the university's president, his, its ace fundraiser, to use cheerleader in chief. Take all of that away, and the truth remains. Stead was a teacher. 
wherever he was, and sometimes he seemed everywhere, he was teaching by example. In his life and by his learning, he taught us three lessons. Mark them well. They are the measure of the man. First, Stead taught us the real meaning of something that's sometimes called the life of the mind. Except that Stead really believed it. He dared to believe that a sharp mind and a moral compass could lead to a better, fuller, more humane life, and perhaps even a better world. He reminded us again and again that the university is all about creating and nurturing sharp minds. He encouraged us to ask hard questions and embrace difficult and sometimes troubling answers. What he meant was this. Wherever we are, in the library or the laboratory, the classroom or the dorm room, on the football field or the basketball court, that's the place to build and to use a sharp mind. Now, excellence is a dangerous word, used too often and often too loosely. Stead taught us that excellence is not a code word for intellectual arrogance. When Stead urged excellence, he was not talking about simply being smart. Smartness was not on Stead's priority list. He encouraged us to make the journey from fact to truth, from knowledge to wisdom. He must have known that the word wisdom is on the university's crest. After an especially contentious meeting, Stead was heard to say, the world is full of smart people. What we need are a few more wise people. Stead knew that a sharp mind needs a soft and a loving heart. And that's the second lesson that he taught. Well, let's use an old-fashioned word here. Stead was big-hearted. His heart told him that there was a world beyond the campus, a world of the poor, the hungry, and the forgotten. And that world was right across the street. When the 2008 economic crisis struck, Stead asked, who is my neighbor? What does my neighbor need? He saw the need, and then being steady, he did something. He mustered TU's forces, joined with the George Kaiser Family Foundation, and created the True Blue Neighbors. True Blue Neighbors fixed roofs. They repaired broken windows. They mended shattered lives. And they gave kids school supplies. One never should underestimate the power of a pencil. And more than that, there was the gift of hope wrapped in real love. The word service is on the university's crest. What Stead did, what his heart led him to do, honors that word. I think it was his finest hour. And the second lesson from Stead is this. Sharp minds fail without soft hearts. The final lesson is the hardest to describe. It is, I think, the most important, the most real, and yet the most elusive. It's something about being open, honest, having a certain generosity of spirit. Stead had that quality about him. He had the character that reveals a genuine soul, someone authentic, someone true blue. A rancher friend of mine up in Osage County put it best. He met Stead just once. And later my friend turned to me and said, Jimmy, that boy is the real deal. The real deal. And so he was. The way Stead lived his life teaches us lessons that inspire and endure. They're imprinted, engraved on the heart of this place. And those lessons are the measure of the man. What we do with them will be the measure of us.
<clears throat> My name is Kent Lightfoot, and uh, I'm a professor at the University of California at Berkeley. And it's truly an honor to be here today. I speak briefly today about Stead's significant contributions in the fields of archaeology and anthropology. I think most of you knew him as a gifted administrator, but he was also a great scholar, a wonderful writer, innovative thinker, and a fantastic teacher, as I think you've already heard. I was privileged to know, along with my wife, Roberta, who's here today, to know Stead and Peggy in graduate school back at the Fighting Sun Devils of Arizona State University in the late 1970s. And this is where Stead embarked on a long, successful, scholarly career that resulted in a plethora of books and articles over the next four decades. He made a number of contributions to North American archaeology, and there's something I want to emphasize here. And there's really, I want to highlight three of his great contributions. The first was his writings emphasize that there was much greater complexity and sophistication that existed in ancient America than what had been previously written. And he wrote vividly about landscapes populated by cities, towns, villages, and evidence of social stratification, elites, prestige trade systems, and complex religious organizations. His second great contribution, the ancient Southwest and other areas of North America once supported much larger populations than had been previously recognized. He did research on pandemics, diseases such as smallpox that were unleashed by early European explorers that had devastating consequences for many native tribes beginning in the 1500s. And then third, he recognized the importance of later ethnographic research done in the late 1800s and 1900s, working with a number of North American tribes. But he noted that you must be careful about using this information when you try to reconstruct and study the past. And you cannot use this as a model for exactly what happened in the past, which some archaeologists were doing. And he talked about the tyranny of the ethnographic present. He really made a significant impact. It was an honor to have worked with Stead on various projects in the field and in the laboratory, and I got to know him very, very well. He was a lucid writer, a brilliant mind. He was very well organized, as I can see on the campus here today. These are traits that have served him very well. But he was also very diplomatic, and he was skilled at working with diverse people. And you could see this early on. And what I want to do is just end my comments with just a brief story that I think epitomizes what we call the big guy, Stead Upham. I want to take you back to the summer of 1978 on the Mugion Rim of Arizona, where Stead and I were doing field work along with a number of other graduate students. What had happened is the Saudi Arabian government and the State Department had developed a program to train Saudi students in the field of archaeology. Instead, was given the task by the Arizona State University campus to oversee this group. And there were six Saudi men who came over to work with Stead and the rest of the graduate group who uh, was there. And the State Department made it very clear that they wanted great sensitivity in working with the Saudis. They wanted a dry camp. No alcohol, no drugs, the women were to dress modestly, no profanity at all. Instead, agreed to that, along with myself and everyone else. But the first week, we had a rather eventful situation. The Saudis, we found out, were very nervous about working in forest. They came from the deserts of Saudi Arabia, and the forests were full of beasts 
and they were nervous about it. We, of course, we assured them, no problem. You know, you're going to be with Stead. I'll be out there. Well, what happened? The first day we were out doing field work, coming out of the trees, we bumped into a black bear. Stead rose to his full six feet eight, and the bear went to his full height, and they looked eye to eye at each other. The bear went one way, the Saudi Stead, and the rest of us ran the other. And that was our first encounter out there. But it led to a second crisis, almost an international crisis. When the Saudis got back, they were a little distraught about seeing this black bear in the forest. And one of the undergraduate students, unbeknownst to us, of course, had offered a marijuana joint to the Saudis to calm them down, because the Saudis were visibly upset. But it turned out the, the Saudis became very disturbed when this gift was presented to them. And Stead and I heard about it. And I was going, oh my God, here we go with an international incident. Newspaper's going to come out, archaeology camp, haven for illegal drugs, Arizona State students offering Saudis drugs. I said, hey, my career, you know, that was my second year of graduate school, it, it's over. I was thinking about calling Denny's to try to get my busboy job back. But instead, instead of just, you know, doing what I was doing, worrying about it, he looked at me, as he always did, and he took control of the situation. And essentially, he was really a gentle giant, and he, and he stood up when we were talking about this, and he would look. I don't know if he did this here on the Tulsa campus, but he'd go to his whole height, and he'd look at you, and he'd say, Kent, we're going to take care of the situation. I said, OK, Stead. So we walked over to the Saudi encampment, which was part of our camp, to apologize for what had happened. The Saudis were obviously offended and insulted, but what happened is, is they were offended because they had been offered this garbage by their American host. This weed, as they said to us, was not fit to smoke by their worst enemy. They then brought out a suitcase, opened it up, and in it were several big bricks of hash from the Middle East. And I looked at Stead, and Stead looked at me, and I said, I thought we were dry, running a dry camp here, for God's sakes. So that was a dilemma. And I said, what are we going to do? We had promised the State Department that we were running a, a dry camp out here. Again, Stead, the big guy. He looked at me, and he said, we'll take care of the situation. And he says, we must respect the Saudis' practices and cultural ways of, they are our guests here. And you could see the anthropology in the great Stead Upham. So what Stead did is he set up the United Nations camp in the Mogollon Rim out in the middle of nowhere. On one side was the American camp. We maintained a dry camp. We didn't have a drop of alcohol. I was in the best health I've ever been in my life. On the other side was the Saudi encampment. And as Stead said, what happened in the Saudi compound stayed in the Saudi compound. And it worked beautifully. Stead really worked this out. What Stead would do is he would provide whatever the Saudis needed into their encampment. He had ties with Navajo, herders and brought in goats and lambs, and the Saudis would take care of them. He trained the Saudis, and they became a great, effective team, and became fantastic workers and really fantastic friends. To this day, though, I have this image of Stead up on the Mogollon Rim, dressed in his field fatigues. He was a very handsome sight. And surrounded by the Saudis who came to half his size, smiling and just enjoying being out there in the wilderness. And a little known contribution of Stead Upham to the field of archaeology was that he was the leader of the happiest archaeology crew to work in the great state of Arizona. In conclusion, Stead was not only a great leader, 
as you are hearing today and what you have seen here at the university. He was a great administrator, but he was also a brilliant scholar, writer, and teacher. But most of all, he was a great guy. He was known as the big guy in the field of archaeology. He had a big heart, big smile, and a big laugh when you talk to him. And I'll tell you, just being here, he's going to be missed by all of us, the big guy. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for being here. This is really a tremendous showing from the Tulsa community and the, the University of Tulsa. Um, thank you to Dr. Clancy, Chaplain Francis, Dr. Rhonda, Kent Lightfoot. Kent, thanks for lightening the mood a little bit and, and transporting us to the Mogollon Rim. I definitely had not heard that story. <laughs> My father, our father and grandfather, would be extremely honored by this showing. Um, he would also probably be quite uncomfortable with the, the number of people here honoring him directly. I don't know how well aware everyone was, but he was simply not one to ever boast. I guess anyone here that, that knew him knew that. And he had so many accomplishments, as, as we've just heard, very long CV, extremely hum always extremely humble about, him, about them, especially to our family. So every time that we would come to Tulsa, it was this kind of uh, twilight zone experience where our father was a local celebrity, we'd walk around and everyone would recognize him. And um, it, it has become more and more clear exactly how much of an impact he had on this community. As, as my sister and I were talking about preparing this, um, we, we sort of have a, we have a different relationship with him, um, and we realized that, that we did not always see eye to eye with him exactly. Eye to eye, literally or figuratively. <laughs> In some ways, we were his biggest critics, and he was always our critic, our coach, our mentor, but always with a lot of love and support in every action. He encouraged excellence, that, that word that, that James Ronda said. But it really was not, was not excellence as smartness. It, it was excellence about always doing your best uh, towards an, uh, an enlightened world, towards, towards progress in that regard. And so we just want to briefly share with you a little bit about the dad that we knew, what we knew that dad loved about life, and what we think that his kind of legacy and context is for the broader world. Stead had many roles to different people. He was Stead, Steadman, Mr. President, Dr. Upham, Grandpa, Uncle Stead. But to us, he was just Dad. And as Nathan said, he was not a public person the way we knew him, especially in our younger years. He enjoyed his time alone very much, reading, writing, doing yard work. He terraced a hillside with my mom and worked on the house, power washing. He loved to sail. He went long distance running, we hiked in the woods with our dogs, and he loved watching sports. Um, but he did enjoy the, the public facing job that he came to have. And it was a pleasure to see him realize these abil abilities he had to communicate visions, motivate people, and affect change. Given our father's appreciation of solitude, Nathan and I were surprised when he accepted the presidency at Claremont Graduate University in 1998 and more surprised when we saw how, how public that job was, and uh, to you, that public role even larger. But he was a fuller embodiment of himself doing that, that work and still enjoyed his time uh, in contemplation on the weekends or 
when he could find time for that. Um, and he was, as Nathan said, just driven by the pursuit of excellence. He told us to do our best, and, and that was the, all we could do in this world with our time here. And, and we saw him do that, and he became that model for us to live by. Um, as was mentioned, he, he had that goal of becoming a university president, and our mom said that was back in as early as 1985 when he was assistant professor at New Mexico State University. And he pursued that goal directionally for 15 years before achieving it. Um, and he, he wanted to just bring I think it's really been said, but lay a, lay a foundation for the future. Um, Nathan and I loved our father, and we'd like to talk about the things that he loved, some of his passions that made him who he is, was. Always will be to us. Our dad loved sports. Anyone that, that knew him knew that he would watch most any sport on TV, uh, basketball, football, golf, but he really especially loved watching football in person. Uh, and this is something that, as far as I could tell, developed while we were at uh, the, uh, living in Eugene, Oregon as we were kids. Um, and we had season tickets to the University of Oregon football games. And for, for six years, we went to every home game uh, at Autzen Stadium in Eugene. And if you know anything about Eugene, Oregon, it is almost always raining. Right? So, so we would be wearing our ponchos. Uh, if it was really raining, then we would also put garbage bags over our legs. <laughs> and there was one game in, I think it was 1990, against the University of Illinois, and it was a game that Oregon was definitely not supposed to win. This is a time when Oregon was, was not good at football. They're, they're now pretty good. <laughs> but there were, I remember it was the last play of the game. It had been a pretty tight game. Oregon was close, but they weren't quite there. But there was a play where... Uh, the Illinois quarterback was actually sacked in the end zone and fumbled it, and a defensive lineman got on the ball, and it was a touchdown. Oregon won the game. I'd never seen my dad so excited. He, he jumped into the aisle. We were, I mean, we had ponchos, it, jumping up and down, pure joy. And it was something that taught me about uh, that, that that is possible, for one, and that um, actually the value of sports in that regard that sports is a, a part of our society where it's one of the few that it's really acceptable to be completely wild and show your emotion. <laughs> and and that, that is something that he for sure uh, loved about being at the University of Tulsa and championing sports here. So I really want to thank you all, all the student athletes that are here. Something that he thought was really important for building community and, and bringing this university together to be what it could be and is. Another thing our dad loved is color. He described himself as a colorist when asked about his paintings. For those of you who haven't seen too many of his paintings, they're just very vivid, uh, meditative explorations of form through the dots that Chaplain Francis described. We saw dad's painting style mature um, over the years, but he would always so humbly say, you know, really, they're not very good. I think later he stopped saying that as much. Um, hopefully, you know, he saw the beauty in, in them like we did. But he was an artist at heart. In our, our garage of our house as young children, there were evidence of past artistic pursuits, ceramics, oil paintings, photography, furniture building. And the creativity and vision he, he translated to his leadership style. Our dad also loved poignant humor. <laughs> He, um, in particular, liked kind of wry humor that, that was telling in its nature. So, so things like Gary Larson's Far Side, the, those comics that, that are often, you have to look at them for a long time and try to, try to figure it out, but often with a scientific basis to them. He also really loved George Carlin. <laughs> so I, I remember, we have a, another memory of, of sitting in our living room in Oregon and Carlin would have these HBO specials that would come on, and we actually got HBO at that time, and so it was a very big deal. We would, would be there right when the, this thing was premiering, and we'd never seen, I think that, that was the, only, the first time that I saw Dad cry, 
like on, on the floor, like like crying, crying like, from laughter. Yeah, at, just like, at, at how, like how doubled over and jokes that were way too crude <laughs> and advanced for us to understand at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I've since watched those specials, and they're they're great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Dad also loved sunshine. He loved sitting, he would sunbathe, like really soaking in the rays. Like, he grew up surfing and body surfing with his older brother Tyler in the ocean off San Clemente, California, at a beach that now four generations of Uphams have fond memories of time spent. Dad loved family. He loved his children, he loved his grandchildren. He encouraged Nathan and I in our educational pursuits and saw that as the best way to empower our future opportunities. He was always interested to hear the latest stories about his grandchildren. One time on a recent visit to Berkeley, when driving in the car with our tired infant, he started singing, the wheels on the bus go round and round, <laughs> which was not something he would have done when we were children, but, um, it warmed my heart to, to hear him lively and, and, and he was very interested in my son Orion's artistic and musical pursuits and Orion would like to share a few words now about his grandfather. Um, my grandpa was always there for me, encouraging me in my music and sports, art, and everything I've ever been interested in. But not only did he encourage me, he inspired me and everybody that he reached out to. And for example, the main reason I took up art was because I wanted to be a great artist just like him. And even though Grandpa lived four states away from me, he always... <laughs> and even though Grandpa lived four states away from me, he was always there in my heart, in our hearts, and I think he always will be. Dad loved mom. Mom, all this is set in motion because of your guys' bond. And this began with some travels. And I don't know how many of you know this story, but um, our mom and dad traveled together in Latin America for about 18 months in 1974 and 75. They drove from Los Angeles to Costa Rica. Um, they purchased a new Volkswagen van at the time, had quit their jobs, put their stuff in storage, and made it all the way through Mesoamerica. They had then continued on uh, in airplanes and, and buses to Bolivia. Th this was a, a trip that we always heard about as kids, and it was one of these things where you know it was kind of a relaxing time around the house, or, or maybe just so something came up to inspire them. And it'd be, you know, that one time in El Salvador, um, and there's all these isolated stories. So, you know, that time when, when dad got almost pickpocketed in a market in Managua, trying to buy 13, size 13 shoes, and obviously a foreigner. <laughs> or that time mom got really sick and there were bullfrogs in the pit toilets. <laughs> or, or that time when dad got intestinal parasites in Bolivia and they needed to go home but not before bringing two orange-cheeked Amazon parrots with them um, on the return trip. We, we later learned a fuller narrative arc about this trip, including how visiting all the pre-Columbian ruins through Mesoamerica and in South America was what helped inspire my dad to go to grad school, get his PhD in anthropology, and become a professor and onto this track to where we stand right now. And it was really, this, this whole bond of, of my father pursuing uh, human origins and trying to understand human origins and culture uh, that, I then, that then inspired me to uh, also pursue evolution. So I'm, I work in evolutionary biology and it's something that my dad and I could talk about. We were always talking about the latest genomic results on human origins or the latest archeological find. And, um, at the time of his death, he was actually planning to have a course at TU on human origins where it would sort of summarize um, 
patterns of migration for the last million or so years. So it's something that he sincerely loved. Dad's partnership with mom was a constant, mutually supportive and loving one. Many a time he would say to me, mom's really special, you know that? <clears throat> it was really exciting for us to see them collaborate and work together in their later life and in dual roles as president and first lady, event planning and creating the life here together. They were also dual artists, uh, my mom with her silver jewelry, my dad with his painting in Santa Fe, with studios side by side. Although they had different musical tastes and uh, as we've heard. <laughs> um, Mom's love and presence has been essential to our family and dad would not have walked the path he did without mom. All of his accomplishments were buoyed by her steady love, support and encouragement. We're both solid team and we love you mom. We love you mom. I love you grandma. <laughs> We want to start wrapping up, but I, I want to share a passage um, from a man that I know my dad deeply admired. All I'm saying is, that, is simply this, that all mankind is tied together. All life is interrelated, and we are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. For some strange reason, I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. This is the interrelated structure of reality. So, so that sounds like it could be from a theoretical physicist. It's from Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King in 1965, speaking at a university commencement at Oberlin College in Ohio. So understanding this inescapable network of mutuality it was something that my dad sincerely embodied throughout his life in the way that he valued his colleagues, and that was surely the case here at, at TU, the way he tried to build people up in his team rather than cut them down, to motivate people by, by mutual upliftment. And that's the same reason that he started this True Blue Neighbors program at TU. As, as, uh, as Doug Fishback told me, one of his favorite lines that they would put in speeches was that we are in the human potential business. And it's this, this kind of ripple effect of um, what you ought to be, this human potential that, um, that helped motivate him and, and this kind of idea that win-win negotiations were, were not only possible but essential in order to actually accomplish things or else um, resentment builds and results get undone. And so, it's one thing to try, to try and understand that, but to actually realize it in a man's life is a very rare thing, and it was something that he was able to begin to approach uh, at the University of Tulsa, and for that we want to thank you, sincerely. While preparing these remarks, Nathan and I were reminded of times Dad would proofread our essays in middle and high school, and in most cases, several paragraphs were X'd out in red pen, Comments in the margin like too wordy or simplify. Sweet and short. That's what he liked. So we'd like to thank Tulsa. We'd like to thank the TU community for being on our father's team for the last 13 years. It's a rare thing to enact your dreams, but he did that here and we, we could see that. Dad didn't talk too much about the, you know, the volunteering, the details of his work, but he would always say how much he loved Tulsa and loved the people here and how great they are. To transform this pain of sudden loss from dad's death feels like an impossibly big mountain to climb. But dad would want us to go forward, remember the lessons he taught us directly and by example. A coworker of mine recently said to me, those who are gone live on by what they set into motion. And I think about that a lot community of scholars, students, and athletes, and others that were set into motion here for generations to come. And we are so proud of our, our father. We're so grateful for you, Dad, for all that you've taught us through words and actions. May we all have the courage to be bright stars, lighting the path towards our greatest collective human potential, helping each other be 
what each of us ought to be. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Well, thank you, Orion. Thank you, Aaron. And thank you, Nathan. That was not easy, and you did a wonderful job. So I need to be honest with all of you. In fact, as a Catholic, I'm driven to confess to you. Last week during Mass, I was not listening to the Gospel readings at all. If you ask me what was the take-home point of that church service, I admit I had nothing at all. So apologies to Chaplain Francis for that. But maybe God was giving me some time to think things through, and I was thinking through things really hard. I was thinking about Stead. Over the past two weeks, when I've had some downtime, some time away from a busy schedule, my thoughts have turned to Stead. I imagine this may be true for many of you. And some clarity came to me during that Mass. Like Jim Ronda, Kent Lightfoot, Chaplain Francis, and his children, I realized that everyone that spent time with Stead learned from him. He was an outstanding teacher and he and scholar and he was teaching all the time. This then begs the questions, why was he such an outstanding teacher and leader, and can we all learn from answering that why question? There is a lesson here for all of us in living a rich and meaningful life. And that lesson is the beauty of being interested and then deeply studying in many things and then connecting those many things for others. Stead was an expert in doing that. He was a guy for so many far-reaching subjects, thoughts, theories, and histories. And in doing so, he saw how so many things were connected, as Nathan just said. Jed was ready to come back and teach. He had promised me he would teach in my new leadership class, and I certainly felt his presence on Thursday as we started that class. For the early part of Stead's career, he was an understanding the roots of man guy. And we were all ready to learn again from him as he got back into the classroom, for he was developing that class in the migration of man dating back to Africa. We know he loved the arts. He loved the art of the TU faculty and students. TU artists work from Whitney Forsyth and Mark Lewis are prominently displayed in Pe Stead and Peggy's house. But he more than loved the art. He jumped into the art and became an accomplished and unique and interesting artist. Stead played college sports, but his love for athletics went far and wide. He was a regular at many of the games. If you had a chance to watch a football game with Stead, when the game was on, you knew he liked to watch the game without interruptions. One of the first games I got to attend with him was the first game of 2015. I was brand new to TU. It was 100 degrees outside. We played in the afternoon. It was three overtimes. And as we were going into the third overtime, I said to Stead, I'm exhausted and I'm just watching the game. And Stead said, welcome to TU Athletics. <laughs> but we did win, of course. Thank you, Coach, for winning. But he more than watched the game. He knew the players. He knew where they were from. He knew their stories and their struggles. Of course he was rooting for TU, but he was also rooting for those players to succeed in life. Maybe a polar opposite of being a sports guy, Stead was a Bob Dylan guy, really showing us all that we can spread our wings far and wide on what our interests could be. Last week, people in our offices recalled how excited Stead was to have in his hand the agreement for the Bob Dylan archives with Bob Dylan's original signature. And last fall, when Ken Levitt texted me that he was trying to get a hold of Stead because Bob Dylan was coming to town and Stead had an opportunity to meet him. So I texted, I texted Stead if he was interested and got an immediate, immediate cell phone call back. And all he said was, hell yes, and then hung up. <laughs> and Stead loved all kinds of music from our student orchestral performances to McCartney to pa uh, Tom Petty to Madonna and Gaga. He really loved it all. That very tall 
an easy to spot man from anywhere in the BOK arena had no shame in dancing to great music at the BOK. He would exchange CDs, we would exchange CDs of artists that we thought each other would like. Every CD I sent him, he loved. Every concert I went to with Peggy instead, they both loved. And again, it was more than the music. It was about the artists and their personal struggles for success. When you would go to a concert with Stead, he would tell you about the artist's life before the concert started. It was more than just music. One afternoon, Paula and I were sitting at a stoplight at 31st and Lewis in our very used, always breaking down, red convertible sports car with 1970s rock and roll music playing full blast. Stead turned the corner in front of us in his big Ford truck and waved. 15 seconds later, I got a phone call from Stead and he asked a simple question. Do you really fit in that car? <laughs> I responded, I sure do. A few weeks later, Stead too had a sports car that he fit into. From then on, he would send me all sorts of articles and books on interesting cars. Several times when I was meeting with Stead, I would notice the scientific journals he was reading. Once it was a detailed study on new immunotherapies for melanoma. So here's an archeologist, anthropologist, talking to a physician about the molecular biology of man. And he knew it all. Another time it was the inflammatory reaction of our brains to the tau protein causing Alzheimer's disease, and he knew that subject deep as well. Probably the best cover of Stead is that he was a man interested in all things Tulsa. In a short amount of time here, he and Peggy adopted Tulsa. He was and is Tulsa. From the start, he knew a great city was always had a great university, and a great user university had to be part of a great city. He made TU more creative, more compassionate, more competitive, more visible to the country and to the world. And in doing so, he made Tulsa stronger too. This connection extended to the TU Golden Hurricane. The football's team motto this year is for our city. That's pure Stead. May we all learn from Stead to stay interested in many things, to study those things and jump in, to look for the best in everything, to look to see how all these things are connected. And in doing so, work every day to make the place you live better. And for all of us here, that place was Tulsa for Stead and Peggy. And we are so grateful to have had the time with both of you. Thank you for being here. In just a moment, Chaplain Francis will close our service. But first, it is my honor to make a special presentation. The University of Tulsa thrives on relationships. With so many relationships, we have developed a number of ways to thank those who inspire us. Along with our distinguished alumni roles and awards, our Halls of Fame, our Pascal Twyman Service Award, the Circle Society, the Chapman Legacy Society, and other forms of honor, we have an award so rare that it has been given only once before it's, uh, it was in existence 12 years ago. The heart of TU established in 2005 and inspired by the late Fulton Collins is an honor reserved for that rare person whose long-term vision and decisive action have transformed the university. The heart of TU celebrates wisdom, insight, and passion that do not simply move the university forward, but redefine its possibilities. As an honor, celebrating the rarest forms of excellence, the heart of TU is awarded not with any regularity, but only as warranted by the exceptional contributions of an individual. Peggy, Nathan, and Aaron, I am honored to act on behalf of the TU family and award the heart of TU to President Emeritus Stedman Upham, whose legacy continues as a force and inspiration in the life of TU. Thank you, and now Chaplain Francis will close our service. know you are loved. You have our heart. And we have yours. We pray that the Lord will hold you. We pray that his comforting hands will be underneath you. 
We pray that he will send you and be up in front of you, drawing you forward, healing your heart. You will always be a part of TU. You will always be a part of our family. You will always be loved. Oh, Lord, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for this beautiful family. We give you thanks for all we have heard. We give you thanks that we will see stead wherever we look. We give you thanks for the joy in his heart and the joy that brought us joy. And now, oh Lord, we pray that you would be with us, that you would comfort, that you would heal, that your hand would present the strong grip of grace around the hearts of Stead's family. Hold them dear. We pray to you, O Lord, our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. We give you thanks for our friend and for our colleague, Stedman Uppo. Amen. Family would like to invite you uh, to join with them on the uh, West Concourse of the Reynolds Center. Uh, they will be there uh, to receive you and to greet you and to give you great thanks for being present this day. Will you stand as the family goes out?